Molt bé, bona tarda a tothom. Si us sembla, comencem. Aquesta presentació no l'havia de fer jo, l'havia de fer l'Albert Canyigueral, que és qui ha organitzat aquestes jornades i qui ha fet aquest programa, que és fantàstic. Però jo vaig aprofitar, primer que sóc el director de l'escola, però sobretot que té una relació personal amb l'Albert Canyigueral i el Julio Quaggiotto, per entrar i autoconviar-me a fer aquesta presentació. Ho vaig fer també per un motiu personal, per saludar-los personalment, perquè ens coneixem fa 10 o 15 anys, però sobretot perquè crec que val la pena no només posar en valor la feina que ha fet l'Albert Canyigueral, que jo crec que és fantàstica de posar en marxa aquest cicle, sinó perquè precisament jo vaig conèixer l'Albert Canyigueral i el Julio Conchotto en mons diferents, en vides diferents, en àmbits aparentment diferents, i que, en canvi, el temps, i si voleu, avui és la prova a fer feina d'això, ens ha anat fent convergir en aquests àmbits. Les diferents persones que aniran passant per aquestes jornades comparteixen coses molt diferents o expliquen coses molt diferents, però, a poc a poc, el que ha anat passant és que ens hem anat trobant en aquesta manera de fer prospectiva del món, d'anar-la veient diferent, hem vist que aquests solapaments. Jo crec que aquest és el gran mèrit de l'Albert, en concret, de posar en marxa aquests seminaris, de com gent que aparentment ve de mons diferents acaben convergint, amb excusa de la innovació, en dir, ostres, el món se'ns està canviant de diferents àmbits, de diferents maneres, de diferents perspectives, però sembla que el que diuen en comú és que canvia i que probablement hem trobat una solució multidisciplinar, transdisciplinar o el que sigui. Jo no dic més coses, li deixo la paraula a l'Albert, que és qui ha de presentar formalment aquest acte i esperem veure-vos que avui ho gaudiu i que això faci que us quedeu en els propers de les properes setmanes. Moltes gràcies a tothom. Moltes gràcies, Ismael. Com bé dius, això és una trobada d'amics, que és la millor manera de poder treballar. I gràcies a l'escola en general també per l'oportunitat de poder curar aquest petit cicle on el que volem és això, explorar i seguir aprenent com, no sé si gestionar o com enfocar les nostres activitats en un món cada cop més complex. També és complex o complicat presentar el Julio perquè fa moltes coses. Jo potser el que us recomanaria és seguir-lo a les xarxes socials, és molt actiu sobretot a Twitter o Equits, segons li vulgueu dir, i va ser justament amb una piulada que va fer fa un temps que vaig descobrir que feia una classe online en el Politécnico de Milano amb temes de disseny de serveis. I just el que vaig apuntar-me a aquesta classe, i va ser molt inspiradora, i va ser un dels punts de partida del disseny d'aquest cicle també, no? Per aquesta necessitat, i comencem amb la conferència sobre aquesta necessitat de repensar les institucions i el sector públic, les administracions, en aquesta era de policrisis, com ens explicarà ara el Julio. Realment estic molt content també de poder-lo presentar i escoltar, i llavors farem una petita sessió de preguntes també al final. Actualment és consultor en innovació a l'oficina del primer ministre d'Emirats Àrabs Units i viu sobretot a Dubai quan no està viatjant, que viatja molt. Havia estat l'antic cap de la unitat d'innovació estratègica del programa de Nacions Unides per al Desenvolupament, en anglès el UNDP, i en el seu llarg recorregut també ha treballat per Nest al Regne Unit, la WWF, el World Wildlife Fund i el Banc Mundial. I ja dic, tampoc vull robar més minuts. Abans, just de passar, de donar pas al Julio, comentar-vos que aquí tenim un servei d'interpretació, teniu un botó aquí al Zoom on podeu agafar el canal també en català. Tenim el John, que és la persona que està fent la interpretació en aquesta conferència. Teniu el xat obert per si teniu problemes tècnics, dubtes i tal on hi haurà l'equip de l'escola donant suport a l'àmbit tècnic. Si teniu preguntes respecte a la conferència, cosa que voleu plantejar, després poseu a la finestra de preguntes de QAnà que posa o preguntes i respostes. I simplement comentar que tot això quedarà després publicat al canal YouTube també de l'escola, tant en català com en anglès. I without any other delay, I give the floor to Julio. Looking forward to listen to your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, the very generous introduction and again for the invitation to speak uh, to both Albert and Ismail and the school. Um, as Albert mentioned, I'm currently working with government in the UAE, but I'm really speaking on, on personal capacity today. Uh, what I want to do is uh, really mostly for this lecture, have a bit of a reflection collectively on two words, really. Uh, the words are risk and uncertainty. These are two words 
that are often used as synonymous. Uh, but I will try to make the case to you that uh, they actually mean different things. And this is quite important in terms of how we design uh, public sector and government. So it has, many of you might have seen this quote uh, before, that's from Madeleine Albright, former US government, uh, said we are trying to solve 21st century problems with 21st century institutions and 19th century tools. Uh, political commentators have talked about demosclerosis or demosclerosis, uh, the disease of government of progressively losing the ability to adapt and innovate. And if you want a chart that somewhat summarizes uh, this feeling, uh, maybe there's no better indication on this. By now, it's already a bit old. An updated version is supposed to come out soon. But it's basically looking at global warming versus the different institutional attempts uh, to tackle the crisis. Um, and whether it's through the COP conferences, whether it's through the intergovernmental mental agreements, uh, we're struggling to keep up and to come up with an institutional response that is effective to a complex crisis like climate change. And of course, uh, you know, it's become almost the cliche now to say that we live in the age of polycrisis, climate change, and other crises are coming uh, at the same time and compounding, accelerating the effects and making the challenge of managing these uh, situations more and more difficult for the public sector. So uh, the result of this is a progressive, often, a loss of trust in institutions. Uh, many of you might have seen this uh, survey that is done every year by Edelman, the Edelman Trust Barometer basically progressively tracks how, uh, by and large, the trust in government and uh, institutions as well international organizations have been decreasing over the years. This year results focus particularly on how well does the public feel that governments are able to handle innovation effectively. Majority of countries, as you can see, uh, are actually the majority of people think that governments don't really have a competence to understand, manage, regulate innovation effectively. Uh, Spain is doing better than most, which is uh, comforting. And the interpretation of what Edelman does of this is that the risk generates a feeling for many people of being left behind. But uh, many things are changing fast and governments are not able to shape this change in a direction that actually makes their lives better. So what is I think this is raising is a, an interesting question when it comes to public sector innovation. Uh, if you take, a, a, you know, a, a, perhaps a more simple, maybe simplistic definition of innovation, which is not enough to have an idea, but this idea needs also to be implemented, but it also needs to add to value. And in the case of a public sector, we are obviously talking about public value. Now, you can argue that in the public sector innovation uh, for the last few years have often concentrated on this question of speed. Can government become faster to move from strategy to implementation? This, of course, is really important, but results like uh, the one I showed you from the Edelman Trust confirm that uh, an equal emphasis needs to be put not only as to whether things are implemented, but are they actually implemented in such a way that they create public value. And this generates a whole different set of very complex and thorny questions uh, for governments to be able to answer to. Uh, Maybe a little bit of a shift is also happening in the public sector in Spain, and I don't know about Catalonia specifically. I just I just thought it was interesting. I came across this survey uh, last week, I think, or the week before, uh, of 
what type of innovations are being introduced in, in the public sector, at least at the level of the ayuntamientos. And uh, you can see that the majority is focusing on services and management where somewhat, the, you know, the issue of speed often and uh, user friendliness is very important. But the missions and the politics is where some of these difficult questions around values often sit. And, and it's, I think it's going to be interesting to see how this picture evolves uh, over time. So what are some of these difficult questions? Uh, some very fundamental ones, for example, what innovation model do you want to follow? Uh, now, many uh, countries have tried to imitate the Silicon Valley model. And obviously, there's an awful lot of interest in to be learn from that, but there's also some really interesting question about it. Uh, Dan Bresnitz, who wrote his book, Innovation in Real Places, uh, made the argument that, uh, you know, the Silicon Valley model has actually generated extremely high level of inequality. And arguably, the country that has followed that model more closely, uh, Israel, has moved from being the second most equal society in the world to being the second most unequal. So, as you can see, you know, this generates really profound questions about what public value innovation creates. Other set of very thorny questions is which industry should we invest in, right? So, many people talk about the resurgence of industrial policy these days. And here again, uh, the decisions are fiendishly complex. So, for example, if you take the case of many countries investing in electric vehicles uh, and starting having second thoughts when you start thinking about the environmental issues related to the rare materials that power electric vehicles, uh, but also the societal outcomes, right? So, Norway, for example, seems to be having doubts about electric vehicles because they fundamentally continue to reinforce and dependence on cars. Yes, they are electric, but still cars, as opposed to actually promoting a more radical rethink about mobility. Or take much more complex question, for example, Europe investing a lot in fisheries in Western Africa, which seems to be triggering uh, food insecurity issues, which in turn turns migration, creates migration problems, which in turn comes back into Europe and maybe creates uh, strong debates about migration. These are the complexity that governments are ha need to handle and the repercussions, intended and unintended, of some of the decisions that need to be taken. Very difficult questions also related to the adoption of technology and automation. Uh, you might be familiar with the case of RoboDebt in Australia. The Australian government has been asked to compensate 1.8 billion Australian dollars because they created an automated system that basically automatically excluded from benefits uh, people that were perceived uh, to be not entitled to these benefits uh, where actually they were. And this created enormous amount of distress, uh, unfortunately also case of suicides, and uh, created a very big debate that is ongoing in Australian society about, for example, the benefit of adopting algorithms for decision making in the public sector. Similar situation you might have seen recently in the UK with the Horizon scandal. Once again, lots of questions about government capability of handling uh, new technologies, of handling that effectively, of procuring effectively, and most importantly, of steering these technologies towards positive public value and public outcomes. So, uh, to sum up, right, so we have this complex situation, because complex moment where the perception seems to be that governments are struggling to answer with deep questions around value, a situation of multiplying crisis, making decision making more and more difficult. And of course, there are many causes, and many root causes of this. But for the purpose of this lecture, as I said, I wanted to focus on two words, risk and uncertainty. 
And these two words being often used in common speech as uh, synonymous, but actually means uh, different things. And I think this distinction is quite important. My argument is that we have uh, public sector institutions that are fundamentally designed for risk. And, but we also need a new set of toolkits, a new set of mindsets that are, that are also able to handle conditions of high uncertainty, such as the poly crisis and the question of public value is actually asking us to adopt. So what is risk? If you follow this logic, I will draw quite heavily on the work of Von Tan. You can see it referenced here. Uh, if you're interested, it's probably uh, someone who's brought some of the most interesting thinking around this distinction of risk and to uncertainty uh, most recently. And uh, risk is a situation, technically speaking, where you know all three things. You know all possible outcomes, you know all the actions that you can take, and you know the probability of each outcome, which means you can calculate the probabilities arithmetically. Now, if you think about your work in government, I don't know about yours, uh, but I think that actually situations that fit these three conditions uh, are many, but there's also many situations where these conditions just don't apply. So uh, I hope Tatiana, who I think is listening, will not take any offense. Uh, I just stole <laughs> a, a slide from one of the presentations she very generously shared on social media recently. So if you think about the transformative challenges that the uh, uh, smart specialization strategy is calling for, for Catalonia, for example, I would argue that, that we can have this discussion that many of the conditions that this type of transformative change arise are actually conditions of uncertainty and not of risk. And trying to tackle this type of uh, transformative work with the tools of risk is actually not a good fit and might cause uh, unintended outcomes. So maybe one of the most iconic pictures to crystallize the notion of uncertainty uh, that I can think of is, I don't know if how many of you remember this, this is um, the uh, war room in the White House when uh, President Obama uh, gave a green light for the uh, uh, raid on Osama bin Laden. Uh, now, I don't know how many of you know the story of what happened before this picture was taken, or the decision was taken to go ahead, but uh, notoriously, President Obama asked all his senior advisors, give me a probability that Osama bin Laden is there. And the advisors answered on a range from 5% to 90%. At which point the president turned to the advisors and said, so what you're telling me is that you really don't know. It's a toss of a coin. This is not a probabilistic decision. And advisors had to concur with him that this was the case. So you cannot hide between the certainty of a number. What you need to acknowledge is that this is a fundamentally a different type of situation. So again, just to reiterate, if you buy into this argument, risk and uncertainty are actually two different things, and they require different tool set, toolkit. With risks, you can mathematically calculate. If it is really true, genuinely uncertainty, the outcomes are not possible to be mathematically calculable. You cannot predict the behavior in the past and project into the future. And risk is really about expecting outcomes, Whereas uncertainty requires being uh, welcoming open-endedness. And again, I don't know how work in uh, uh, public sector looks like in Catalonia, but in my experience, open-mindedness is not necessarily the strength uh, of administrations, open-endedness. So how does this translate into practice? It's, uh, I'll give you a practical example. So I was working in the past with the government in Southeast Asia. And they were very worried uh, about the potential 
impact of automation on workers? How many jobs will be lost to automation? And uh, they proudly showed me a report from a top consultancy company saying X amount, you know, X millions of jobs are going to get lost. And I said, okay, but let's take a look at this for a moment. And so I pulled out this review done by the MIT in the US that looked at all the predictions from all the top consultancies in the world in terms of the impact of automation. And the conclusion from the mighty MIT was there is only one conclusion, we have no idea. Because there are so many variables uh, in trying to predict the future of work that makes this a phenomenon that emerges and is impossible to really predict in the numerical fashion that you would like to have. And again, I would argue this is fairly typical of many of the decisions that government need to take in conditions of high uncertainty. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen this book from uh, John Key, uh, who is the former FD economist and the former chancellor of, uh, of the Bank of England, uh, which is called Radical Uncertainty. And so here you have two top-notch economists, uh, former head of the Bank of England, uh, who actually put forward something like this. Uh, sensible public policy cannot be determined by quantitative assessments of policies using probabilistic reasoning. Uh, I think, you know, when you have this level of quote-unquote mea culpa, it's actually interesting to reflect upon it and what it might mean. And of course, the fact that risk and uncertainty are used as synonymous, you can argue that makes decision-making actually more, com more confusing. So, you know, this is an example from WHO in the middle of a COVID crisis. You might remember the question was at the beginning whether you should restrict travel or not. Now, with hindsight, I think most people would say that actually, yes, it would have been beneficial to restrict travel from the very beginning. The language that the WHO was using was that of a careful risk assessment, where in reality, arguably, this was a condition of high uncertainty because the level of spreading of COVID was unlike anything that we've seen before, and so it was not possible to make prediction based on past behavior. Would it have been easier, or not easier, certainly not easier, but would it have actually been helpful to acknowledge that this is condition of uncertainty and then look for a different set of decision-making supporting tools? This is, I think, is, a, is an interesting question. And of course, there's been enormous debate looking back at the lesson of COVID on what has happened. So my argument would be, but I'm very curious to see if you share the same experience, uh, that probably the three most difficult words to say when you're in government is, I don't know. But maybe translates into in Spanish or in Catalan. Um, but, uh, and this is a general mindset that often dominates decision-making in government. And this mindset is an emergent property, something that emerges for the tools that we are using to support decision-making, more often than not. So if you think about the traditional tools we are often using in government, like, for example, best practice and benchmarking, if you're dealing with a situation of uncertainty where the past is not a predictor of the future, arguably these are not very useful tools. Uh, log frames where you need to say, this is exactly what I'm going to deliver by exactly this date, uh, the traditional evaluation tools. Or think about traditional procurement. How can you procure, for example, technologies that you don't even know exist? or that you have no idea what impact they might have because they are so early stages that nobody really knows, even the experts. Most people, decision makers, are training in inductive and in deductive reasoning. But conditions of high uncertainty require a different type of reasoning, right? It's what is called abductive reasoning. How do you take decisions in conditions of one-off for which there is no precedent? 
And so if you look at the toolkit, KPIs is another good example. Think about KPIs. Often they're meant to say, this is what I promised that I delivered. And this is exactly what I delivered. But so, you know, paradoxically, you are uh, rewarding sticking to a plan. And in condition of uncertainty, actually what you want to reward is adapting, learning, pivoting as conditions actually change. And so, again, I don't know what your world looks like. I just pick some examples from my experience, but this is, for example, a project management, project plan that we need to put together when I was working at UNDP. And this is what uh, Fia Snow has called artifacts of certainty, right? So things that provide a false sense of certainty when dealing with conditions that are uns uh, uncertain, but give a sense that bureaucratically we are having under control, right? And so, again, uh, when I mean, in many situations where both a person who's filling in this template knows very well that they are not going to deliver this thing in 2025 exactly on that date, but the bureaucracy requires them to actually write this into log frames. And of course, everybody knows that there will be adaptation, but it's very difficult once these things are written down in documents to actually open up other possibilities. Another example, you know, what I find is often happening in bureaucracies is the syndromes of writing everything down, right? As if, if you had a complete list of issues, you are actually somewhat better able to manage them. Uh, for example, I don't know if you've ever seen the UK government every year publishes this National Risk Register, which is a fairly phenomenal document. This is just a, a short snapshot of risks they identify every year. And again, these are incredibly powerful tools. But the reality is, well, if you look at the list of things that are listed here, often what we're talking about is really uncertainty. And no matter what careful register of all possible risks you have, stuff happens um, that just doesn't fit neatly these categories. So, of course, it's useful to think about some of these things, but really uh, the toolkits that we need probably needs to look different to handle this effectively. Which leads to, again, the question and the feeling that many times Governments produce fantastic strategies that do not survive the first encounter uh, with reality. And you might have seen this picture many times before, but it basically summarizes the feeling uh, where we started from of, you know, decreasing trust on in institutions for not being able to actually adapt. Final point I will make on this is uh, something that uh, arguably, I don't know what is your experience in government, but again, if I look back at my experience, so you can say that uh, this is from Marco Steinberg, right? Uh, public sector innovation is actually more a question of uncertainty than of risk. You're basically saying the current system does not work and we need to try a different system. Now, when you make this argument to decision makers, I don't know what's your experience, but often you're saying, well, you know, we all know what we are doing on employment is not working. We need to rethink radically employment or mobility. And everybody says yes, but then the first question that they are asked is, show me that it has worked. Show me an example that it has worked somewhere else or in some other countries, etc. Right? And, and that is exactly the attitude, the risk mindset. Where actually what you're saying is, no, we need to move to a different system that works in a different way, and we just don't know exactly what it's going to look like. So if you buy this argument, then the question is to say it's not that the tools for risk are not useful, but we need to be careful in distinguishes what are situation of risks from situations of uncertainty and develop uh, a set of tools that are actually make us uh, effective in conditions of uncertainty. 
So what are these tools? What will be a different toolkit for conditions of uncertainty look like? I just made a list here. I will not go through every single one of them. Uh, I would like to point you to a guide. I don't know if, uh, if you've come across it from the EU, but it's actually meant for senior decision makers in condition of high uncertainty, uh, where some of these tools are explained as well as others. Uh, and there's a much more comprehensive list. What I would like to, I'll just focus on a couple of examples that are partially drawn from my own experience uh, working at uh, UNDP, United Nations Development Program, where we embarked on a journey specifically to acknowledge that the world we were working with, the tools we were working with, the tools of our projects uh, were really designed for conditions of risk and acknowledge that we need to broaden our palette of tools to actually have and be able to handle also conditions of uncertainty. So I'll show some of the things that we did, some of the thoughts, as well as examples from other governments. Now, one general principle that I think is quite important for me is uh, when you're working with situations of high uncertainty, the last thing that you want to do is to reduce your options. What you want to have in condition of high uncertainty is lots of options available to you because you need to adapt quickly. You need to quickly mobilize things as the situation changes. And this is quite different from the dominant uh, innovation model that is often used also in the public sector, which again takes a cue from uh, the startup mode where you basically say, you use a funnel. You try lots of things, lots of pilots, in the hope that you reduce uncertainty and find the magic bullet for one solution, then when you scale. And so everybody's talking about scaling as if there was one potential solution, for example, to mobility, and then you need to scale that across. Now, this model is A, uh, very dispersive, right? So you have lots of things that are dispersed during the process. But most importantly, what it does, it is reduces the options that are available to you. Now, I would argue that what we need is the opposite for conditions of high uncertainty. We need a model of innovation that expands and layer options and learning over time. And, you know, at UNDP, we call this a portfolio approach. There's many other ways, you know, the mission-oriented mechanism that they use promoting arguably fits nicely into this as well. Um, and again, certainly everything that I see from uh, the presentation from Tatiana, my pure interpretation also seems to be working in this type of direction. If any of you is interested, I co-wrote a paper with Mariana Mazzucato and other colleagues looking at the lessons from COVID, where again, one of the big things that stood out is that governments that had lots of options at their disposals were actually able to handle conditions of uncertainty more effectively. Whereas governments that had reduced their options over time in question of efficiency, reducing redundancy, etc., find it harder to actually uh, handle uh, a crisis like uh, COVID. So I'll just talk about one simple example. Um, uh, for example, uh, of a mindset of it accepts uncertainty rather than risk. So I think most governments uh, are used to think in terms of objectives, right? And an objective might look like something like this. We will digitize hospital healthcare and reduce the waiting list by 30%. Now, this is of course great, but imagine talking about the objective of what you're trying to do in this way. We will redesign health so that doctors and nurses are close to patients. Maybe we won't even need hospitals. And we'll focus on prevention rather than cure. 
Now, what you can see here is two different mindsets, right? So one is where in some ways you've already identified your option, precluded your option. The solution is going to be digitization. And you're sort of saying this is what is going to happen and set a clear, not only with the direction, but also the destination. The one that talks about redesigning health is much more open-ended. Of course, it's much more ambiguous and vague. It can be interpreted in many different ways. And arguably, this is actually what it requires. It requires sense-making, continuously understanding, as you implement actions here, whether you're following the North Star or not. And if you're not, that you need to adapt. And so it puts quite a lot of responsibility in this continuous process of discovering and creating options that take you close to this North Star. Now, again, if you look at the EU uh, policy, innovation policies all framed around missions, goes very much in this idea that you select, a, you know, point to an intent rather than precluding your options through an objective. So again, objectives, what you do with an objective is you work to define the ideal state and also you say how you want to go there through digitization, for example. This works really well for conditions of high predictability. If you're working with conditions of uncertainty, you don't start from an ideal future and work backwards from it. You look at the present, you ask how can the present evolve differently, and then you basically set a general North Star, but you don't say and specify how you're going to get there. This to me is fundamentally the uncertainty mindset, is being open to these many possibilities. So how does this translate into practice? Some of you might have seen uh, the framework put forward, for example, by the Finnish government uh, when they talk about humble government. And as you can see here, they're trying to make a difference between conventional, traditional policymaking and what they call humble policymaking, right? So again, you start from a condition where you say, I don't know. And one of the big differences is but again, you try to set a common direction, but then you tell people, go experiment. Because all the solutions are not known up front, you discover by doing, you don't have all this knowledge ex ante, a priori, you discover things by doing, and therefore you also need to have a strong emphasis on learning and adaptation. So, I was struck, for example, by this manifesto in, in Finland from the previous government, I think, uh, where the, the part of the manifesto was saying, we don't have upfront all the solutions, but what we promise to you is that we are going to learn fast and we are going to learn better than others, which I think politically is, is quite bold. If you accept this, then you, you know, if you accept that this uncertainty mindset sets a direction and then you need to be able to adapt and knowing where you're going accordingly, maybe uh, decision making, the way we traditionally know it in government, needs to change as well. So with Jeff Mulgan, we've, for example, tried to reimagine what it would look like to think about a, a decision-making process in government where you don't have the typical, you know, everybody sitting around a very formal room uh, with the models and projections based on past data, with some report produced by a consultancy giving you a sense of certainty that you know all the possible answers, and maybe two or three uh, pre-cooked options that are available to you. I'm, of course, exaggerating, uh, but we were trying to think what would it look like to take decisions differently in condition of uncertainty. And so Jeff mostly came up with this idea of a four-piece room, which is now being prototyped in some organizations, 
But you basically say, how do you create conditions of decision makings uh, where you train yourself, decision makers, to look at evidence that may be contradictory? Uh, think about the COVID situations, right? Many things coming in that were contradictory, but this was a crisis situation, but many other areas of work don't have clear cut answers, like the example of the electric vehicles I was making, right? How do you create a room where you create the ability to interact with these many different contradictory forms of evidence? where you show a constant supply of options uh, that are available by looking at what is promising, what is emerging, what are the patterns that you can see. So we basically envisage this 4P room as an interactive way, as a different way to imagine policy steering rooms inside government, where also different type of expertise I brought together in the anti-disciplinary uh, philosophy that Ismail was talking about a front. You could imagine that in this type of room, you could have people that have real world experience in many different fields that come from many different backgrounds, thereby hopefully enriching the decision-making process in itself. I think sense-making has become a bit of a buzzword in uh, uh, decision-making circles these days. Uh, but I think this is really one of the fundamental assets in, a, in, in an uncertainty mindset is that you're actually able uh, to look at a changing situation, trying to distill and make sense of it to produce actionable intelligence. At UNDP, we actually developed a sense-making protocol to basically being able to say out of all these very different projects and activities that we are doing, that are very siloed and compartmentalized. How do we move from the dance floor to the balcony to look at the patterns of what is emerging? And how do we do this in a dynamic way so that we build the organizational muscle to change and take decision in condition of high uncertainty? In practice, this also ch means, for example, literally changes the templates. Right? So I showed you a project template. Now we can see what the portfolio template looks like in our case. If you're saying you want to create a set of options, a constant supply of options, you're starting looking perhaps at the momentum. Are you going more or less in the right direction of your uh, intent, of your North Star? What are the frequency of new intelligence and new learning that you're creating? What does something that look like this can actually support a different type of mindset, which is more open to adaptation? We also experimented with different forms of capacity building for, for our management. So for example, we played alternative reality simulations uh, where we expose decision makers to higher and higher level of uncertainty and they could role play in this format what it would actually look like uh, to be in conditions where they could not rely on data to really alone to take their decisions, but they've had many different uh, unexpected circumstances being thrown at them and actually being able then to be able to say, what does a decision, robust decision-making process look like in situation like this? We created a dedicated program with uh, Imperial College where we shadowed, uh, we got, for example, our senior managers to shadow a surgeon. Uh, why? Because surgeons are used to working in conditions of high uncertainty. Uh, we got them to shadow a magician. We got them to shadow a pilot. All uh, different disciplines where the question of uncertainty is treated in a very different way. And the reason to do this this way is that uh, we found that putting people in conditions where it's obvious that they don't know, because of course a manager is not in a development organization, is not a surgeon. So it's quite okay to say, I don't know, uh, actually creates the conditions uh, to be more open to then saying, okay, uh, when I go back into my workplace, can I actually accept these conditions and how would I take decisions in a condition of uh, uncertainty moving forward. 
I find it interesting that, you know, this is actually very challenging. And so, for example, uh, Brazilian government has a laboratory which is pairs up innovation specialists with psychologists precisely to look into this question of how to create psychological safety for public sector officials to operate in condition of experimentation, high level of ambiguity. How does that look like? What are the new competencies and skills that need to be developed? Uh, I'll just point you to one final resource in this space. Uh, Vaughn, that I mentioned before, has actually developed a toolkit which is called for productive discomfort. And more recently has produced a toolkit for not knowing. These are examples of maybe a new set of tools and things that uh, we could develop for the public sector to be equally able to operate, not only in condition of risk, but also in condition of uncertainty. So to wrap it up, uh, I think it's a very interesting question to start thinking, you know, are, if you buy into my argument, organizations, can they be redesigned uh, to accept condition of uncertainty as well as risk? Now, the UK is the only government that I've seen so far that has created a, a position of head of uncertainty. And I think it's very interesting also to look at the reaction that we've got in the media, where we were by and large laughed at and criticized all sorts of jokes going on on social media, which I think is a, is a really um, telling of a political difficulty to actually accept this notion and how to incorporate it. Now, I don't think it's necessarily, I would argue, but we can have this discussion to create new positions. But what I think is becoming, to me anyway, a really fundamental skill is being able to distinguish between problems that lend themselves to a risk mindset and framework and problems that lend themselves to uncertainty. And then being able to take and follow different decision-making paths and approaches based on this distinction. There is a role for risk assessments, best practices, benchmarking, etc. But this is not, uh, cannot be a one size fit all. There is a different set of issues that for which require a different set of tools. So uh, it's, I think it's interesting that you start seeing people thinking about this quite uh, a lot. And so, for example, again, Jeff and others have created this uh, organization called the Institutional Architecture Lab. Uh, which is starting to think what it would look like to design new institutions that are able to operate both in condition of risk and uncertainty. At UNDP, we ended up developing a different competency framework uh, to basically saying, you know, what would be the competencies, right? This is uh, that would be required to work uh, with uncertainty. And can we actually start to think about uh, different things quite significantly. For example, one experiment that is probably starting soon is can we have open-ended roles, which means where the TORs are open and more open because they, people need to operate under conditions of uncertainty. And so they need to be able to adapt, they need to be able to find their way out of certain things. What does that look like? What does a, an open-ended terms of reference role look like, as an example? How do you change your evaluation to emphasize learning and adaptation? These type of questions, I think, then become very practical in terms of embedding this in institutions. So to end uh, on a positive note, uh, I just wanted to leave you with this quote from Pia Andreas that I think you'll hear very, very soon in the next lecture. So just to give you a teaser, but it's one of my favorite uh, quotes. And she says, we design the institutions we have today, we can do it again. And again, if you buy my argument, design for uncertainty is one of the things we might want to think about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julio. Has been extremely, extremely interesting and very, very up to date. I think I have some positive reaction here on the uh, on the chat. Also, um, 
and uh, and I think you are g- giving a ton of homework to the to Ismael and his team <laughs> at the EAPC. On the I don't know, if, I think he's still around, but uh, I think you're, you're giving a lot of a lot of interesting uh, parts to to explore Sorry, on, on, on how and how to deal with these uh, sends on, on 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 all these complex topics and all the all the themes that you're providing. We have one or two questions from the Q and A. Uh, there's one question uh, from Josep Ramon Arisa, and then when we have a few minutes, so he's asking. I'm not sure if it's possible to answer so precisely, but uh, uh, Josep Ramon is asking which is the best model approximation to a holistic and integrated decision ecosystemic model to obtain impact and public value. Probably this. Maybe I'm not sure there's a model, but maybe some hints or some references that you can Yeah, see. again, I think, you know, this is exactly the topic of experimentation these days, right? So I think you can try to see many different forms and shape of asking these questions. So to me, the work that is done by the Institute of Public Value at UCL, right? Mariana Mazzucato and the whole framing of missions is clearly in this space, right? Starting to ask this question. Tatiana probably here is better qualified than me to talk about transformative innovation policy and other framework that is being used in terms of do of how to think about this. Um, there is an interesting field emerging uh, on uh, transformative investments, right? Which is also related to that, which looks at how do you design investments that actually take this logic and this different form of decision making into account. Uh, I mentioned, you know, there is a whole body of work on portfolio, dynamic portfolio management that certainly for us at UNDP uh, was a big source of inspiration. There's quite a lot of work going on, for example, at the Griffith in- University in Australia on place-based innovation and what they call challenge-based innovation, which again takes into account this, you know, it tries to develop what I guess is what you're getting into is across an ecosystem, how you take this type of decisions. There is a uh, climate kick uh, where mm-hmm. I worked before that is experimenting with this model of uh, deep demonstrations. And I just set up with other organization, assistant transformation lab precisely to explore these things. So, uh, my sense is there is not one model, but there is lots of research going on at the moment, a lot of uh, curiosity and anxiety, which is derived precisely by this feeling that the current model is not working, but just quite what the new world looks like, I think is really something that everybody is proactively, but not everybody, but lots of people are certainly thinking about. And I'm happy to provide references to any of this if any of you is uh, is interested. Yeah, we will write a, a blog post with this video and with all the references because you've been very encyclopedic, so we'll need to get all the all the references uh, so people can keep uh, keep learning on this topic. And I think also with this humble approach that uh, in order to remain opti- optimistic for the, about the future, I think it's this process of continuous learning and, and joining this flow of research, this flow of activists, who are trying to make things better because the di- diagnosis of uh, this is not working as we as it used to work in industrial era. That's quite uh, that's quite clear. And, and so, um, um, sorry, Albert, just to comment on this, because I think uh, you mentioned one thing that maybe is also relevant to the previous questions and perhaps the one that is being put in the chat now, if I understand it correctly. Um, so, you know, you can think about some, I, I really think it's very interesting to think about the rituals in government and how they translate into competencies, right? So, for example, a distinction that I often like to make, inspired by a lady called Pamphia Lee, is uh, reporting, right? Uh, Upstream data. So, you're supposed to write endless reports with results that go up a chain in government, and then you never know what actually happens with this data. This data is not useful to you. Uh, it's useful for sure upstairs for some kind of accountability thing, but it's actually a pain for you to do it, which means that you often there's plenty of ethnography, people invent data, uh, people massage the data because there's zero utility for them, right? And this is exactly that part of risk mindset that says, okay, I fill in the spreadsheet, I send the reports upstairs. Imagine a different flow, which is the downstream data, data that is useful for you, 
as a person who is managing something that actually allows you to do things better. Now, that is a data that typically is much messier, but it's not an easy answer. It's not cleaned up to fit into a spreadsheet. And how do you interpret that and how do you work with that? But also as a government, how do you put equal emphasis on downstream data, not only on upstream data? So these are things that are really interesting to question, I find, and if we want to create a space to create competencies to work in a different way. Thank you. Maybe we have just the last minute. There was another sure. question, as you were saying, on the on the chat, uh, very specific. And again, maybe it's a little hard to answer in a, in a precise way, but which are the new skills, uh, competences uh, that should the public workers uh, develop? You show uh, at the end of your talk a little bit this schema that we will later on also share on the, on yeah. the blog post. And and uh, what are, and well and, and if everything that we've learned so far it mm, cannot be useful for this new world or what what the, 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 the skills and competences maybe it's very, so, uh, very precise to the school. I'll give you a very practical example which always stuck with me. So uh, Prime Minister Trudeau in Canada, when he started his first mandate, he went around and say, "Why are we not doing more innovation and experimentation?" And he was told, "We don't have budget and we don't have a mandate." So he actually sent an open letter to all his ministers and saying, I want you to experiment and you shall allocate a percentage of your budget to experimentation. Right? This went on the papers. Now, how many experiments do you think this generated in the first year of government? The answer is two, I think. Right. So I talked to the team behind it. Why? Because if you have a risk mindset and all of a sudden you tell people, oh, go experiment and it's good, embrace uncertainty, etc., all people hear is my job is on the line, right? Uh, and the tools that support this, right? So go and experiment, but then the auditor come back at you to say, how exactly did you spend that penny of money? And you know that this, your job is going to be terminated because you're not able to actually fill in that standard auditor um, scheme, right? So it's not enough to just say, okay, we need to do more of this. The competencies then, if you think about experimentation, become very different in terms of actually what you think, where you draw the line, what is possible for you to do. How do you create a space to do things? How do you create space to adapt? And how do you, again, avoid being locked into one particular project, pilot, etc., because that's the only thing that bureaucratically you can make work. So uh, being able to operate in this space requires very different type of mindset. And even a top mandate and a budget alone doesn't cut it, right? And I think this is really a whole process of discovery that we are going through. It's actually what it takes to make it. Thank you very much. We've reached the uh, end of the allocated time for this for this webinar. I think you are setting very clearly that the North Star, a little bit on what you were saying, the exact path might be still unclear and uncertain. Uh, back to the point of your of, of, of your presentation. Uh, but it has been very enlightening and with all the all the information that uh, that you share, and we will again compile all, all this data. And I'm sure that uh, with some of the attendees, there'll be a group of people already exchanging information and experiences, and hopefully you can include more examples from the Catalan government in the future also and the public and the Catalan public administration in general on your on your presentation. Thank you very much. Also, thank you. Uh, uh, noting uh, here in the chat that the next webinar, this is a cycle uh, over the over the year with uh, five different uh, events, and as you also mentioned, Pia Andrews will be our next guest which will be online on April 15. Uh, you can register at the link that you have on the on the chat. Thank you, Julio. Thank, Thank you very you. much, everybody. And, uh, and yeah, uh, see you around. To be continued. Ciao. Bye-bye. <laughs>